Chapter Two of The Sky Is Falling. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Karen Savage. The Sky Is Falling by Lester Del Rey. Chapter Two. Whatever they had done to patch him up hadn't been very successful, apparently. He spent most of the time in a delirium. Sometimes he was dead, and there was an ultimate coldness, like the universe long after the entropy death. At other times, he was wandering into fantasies that were all horrible. And at all times, even in unconsciousness, he seemed to be fighting desperately to keep from falling apart painfully within himself. When he was awake, the girl was always beside him. He learned that her name was Nima. Usually there was also the stout figure of Sir Perth. Sometimes he saw Sather Carf or some other older man working with strange equipment, or with things that looked like familiar hypodermics and medical equipment. Once they had an iron lung around him, and there was a thin wisp over his face. He started to brush it aside, but Nima's hand restrained him. "'Don't disturb the sylph,' she ordered. Another semi-rational period occurred during some excitement or danger that centered around him. He was still half delirious, but he could see men working frantically to build a net of something around his bed, while a wet, thick thing flopped and drooled beyond the door, apparently immune to the attacks of the hospital staff. There were shouting orders involving the Undine. The salamander in Dave's chest crept deeper and seemed to bleat at each cry of the monstrous thing beyond the door. Sather Carf sat hunched over what seemed to be a bowl of water, paying no attention to the struggle. Something that he seemed to see there held his attention. Then he screamed suddenly, "'The sons of the egg! It's their sending!' He reached for a brazier beside him, caught up the fire, and plunged it deep into the bowl of water, screaming something. There was the sound of an explosion from far away as he drew his hands out, unwet by the water. Abruptly the undine began a slow retreat. In Dave's chest the salamander began purring again, and he drifted back into his coma. He tried to ask Nima about it later when she was feeding him, but she brushed it aside. "'An orderly let out the news that you are here,' she said. But don't worry. We've sent out a doppelganger to fool the sons, and the orderly has been sentenced to slavery under the Pyramid Builder for twenty lifetimes. I hate my brother. How dare he fight us with the sky falling!" Later the delirium seemed to pass completely, but Dave took no comfort from that. In its place came a feeling of gloom and apathy. He slept most of the time, as if not daring to use his little strength even to think. Sir Perth stayed near him most of the time now. The man was obviously worried, but tried not to show it. "'We've managed to get some testosterone from a blind homunculus,' he reported. "'That should put you on your feet in no time. Don't worry, young man. We'll keep you vivified somehow until the sign changes.' But he didn't sound convincing. "'Everyone is chanting for you,' Nima told him. "'All over the world the chants go up.' It meant nothing to him, but it sounded friendly. A whole world hoping for him to get well. He cheered up a bit at that, until he found out that the chants were compulsory, and had nothing to do with goodwill. The iron lung was back the next time he came to, and he was being tugged toward it. He noticed this time that there was no sylph, and his breathing seemed to be no worse than usual. But the sight of the two orderlies and the man in medical uniform beside the lung reassured him. Whatever their methods, he was convinced that they were doing their best for him here. He tried to help them get him into the lung, and one of the men nodded encouragingly. But Dave was too weak to give much assistance. He glanced about for Nima, but she was out on one of her infrequent other duties. He sighed, wishing desperately that she were with him. She was a lot more proficient than the orderlies. The man in medical robe turned toward him sharply. "'Stop that!' he ordered. Before Dave could ask what he was to stop, Nima came rushing into the room. Her face paled as she saw the three men, and she gasped, throwing up her hand in a protective gesture. The two orderlies jumped for her, one grabbing her and the other closing his hands over her mouth. She struggled violently, but the men were too strong for her. The man in doctor's robes shoved the iron lung aside violently and reached into his clothing. From it he drew a strange double-bladed knife. He swung toward Dave, raising the knife into striking position, and aimed it at Dave's heart. The egg breaks, he intoned hollowly. It was a cultured voice, but there was a refinement to his face that registered on Dave's mind even over the horror of the weapon. The fools cannot hold the shell, but neither shall they delay its breaking. 
Dead you were, Mandrake's son, and dead you shall be again. But since the fault is only theirs, may no ill dreams follow you beyond Lefe. The knife started down just as Nima managed to break free. She shrieked out a phrase of keening command. The salamander suddenly broke from Dave's chest, glowing brighter as it rose toward the face of the attacker. It was like a bit from the center of a star. The man jumped back, beginning a frantic ritual. He was too late. The salamander hit him, sank into him, and shone through him. Then he slumped, steamed, and there was nothing but dust falling toward the carpet. The salamander turned, heading toward the others, but it was to Nima it went, rather than the two men. She was trying something desperately, but fear was thick on her face and her hands were unsure. Abruptly, Sather Karf was in the doorway. His hand lifted, his fingers dancing, words hissed from his lips in a stream of sibilance too quick for Dave to catch. The salamander paused and began to shrink doubtfully. Sather Karf turned, and again his hands writhed in the air. One hand darted back and forward, as if he were throwing something. Again he made the gesture. With each throw, one of the false orderlies dropped to the floor, clutching at a neck where the skin showed marks of constriction, as if a steel cord were tightening. They died slowly, their eyes bulging and faces turning blue. Now the salamander moved toward them, directed apparently by slight motions from Sather Karf. In a few minutes there was no sign of them. The old man sighed, his face slumping into lines of fatigue and age. He caught his breath. He held out a hand to the salamander, petted it to a gentle glow, and put it back over Dave's chest. "'Good work, Nima," he said wearily. "'You're too weak to control the salamander, but this was done well in the emergency. I saw them in the pool, but I was almost too late. The damned fanatics! Superstition in this day and age!" He swung to face Dave, whose vocal cords were still taut with the shock of the sight of the knife. "'Don't worry, Dave Hansen. From now on every Sir and Sather will protect you with the lower and the upper magic. The house changes tomorrow if the sky permits, and we shall shield you until then. We didn't bring you back from the dead, piecing your scattered atoms together with your scattered revenant, particle by particle, to have you killed again. Somehow we'll incarnate you fully. You have my word for that." Dead? Dave had grown numb to his past during the long illness, but that brought it back afresh. Then I was killed? I wasn't just frozen and brought here by some time machine? Sather Karf stared at him blankly. Time machine? Impossible. Of course not. After the tractor killed you and you were buried, what good would such fantasies be, even if they existed? No. We simply reincarnated you by pooling our magic, though it was a hazardous and parlous thing with the sky falling." He sighed and went out, while Dave went back to his delirium. End of chapter 2